we continue our look at the apostles today and we I think sometimes we read the Bible we read what's on the page and uh, we think there's nothing else going on but there's a lot more going on the Bible is not a novel it doesn't give us every single detail that went on otherwise the book would be much much larger for sure I'm sure that they laughed together, they cried together, they did all sorts of things. They even certainly had disagreements as well. In this series, we've looked at some examples of disagreements that the apostles had. Simon the Zealot, he was the anti-government guy who was willing to take up arms against Rome, and he was paired with Matthew, who was the tax collector, uh, who was collecting taxes on behalf of the oppressive Roman government. You think they liked each other? No, they didn't. But Jesus picked both of them to be apostles. We already talked about that uh, a while ago in our, our uh, series. But uh, that's the thing about the Bible. It gives us the whole story. It doesn't sugarcoat things, especially when it talks about the individual people. It gives us the good, the bad, and the ugly, as they say. We know that Noah got drunk. Moses was a murderer. David was an adulterer. We can go through the whole list. We don't excuse those things at all. We, that shows us how God takes imperfect and broken people and he uses them for his glory. Another individual was last week, we talked about Saul of Tarsus, how he was responsible for weeding out and ratting out these uh, Christ followers and having them killed like Stephen, who uh, was stoned to death. Yet he became the apostle to the Gentiles. We call him the apostle Paul. So I wanted to look last week at him first to get, refresh our memories on his story leading up to this. And uh, we'll continue with him and an encounter that he had with the Apostle Peter that Paul writes about in his letter to the Galatians. He talks about a time where he felt it was appropriate to publicly call out Peter for something he was doing that was wrong. And so we'll read it. It's a very brief uh, account in Galatians chapter 2. We're just going to read from verse 11 up to 16. So Paul writes, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law because by observing the law, no one will be justified. So I ask the Lord's blessing on the reading and hearing of his holy word. What's happening here is that under the new covenant, Jews had been accepting into fellowship non-Jewish people. And uh, they were, people were raised with different customs. They were used to wearing different clothes, eating different things. And this is a big change. This is a big change of pace because before Jesus was crucified and resurrected, well, the Jewish people were commanded to uh, obey certain customs and certain rituals in order to separate themselves from the other nations. But uh, one of the things, for instance, was that Jewish boys had to be circumcised. That's what they still do that to this day. They turn 13, they have a bar mitzvah, that's what happens there. And their dedication to that law was so great that Paul refers to them here as the circumcision group. That's what they do. That's sort of their trademark. Now, sometimes we get a little uncomfortable talking about that. So maybe how about how about the laws governing clothes instead? Uh, they were not make, permitted to mix fabrics. 
okay? Um, it wasn't so much a moral issue. doesn't really matter what you wear as long as you're covered up. But God knew that the other nations were doing this. You could tell by the way they dressed that they were one way. God said, I want my people to stand out and be separate. So don't be mixing fabrics. And that's just to separate one nation from the others. It wasn't so much a moral issue, but God commanded them to do it. Now, God, um, the important thing to realize is that whether a person was obedient every single day of their life to, to the clothing laws and, and guidelines, it still never saved them just because they did that. The same goes with the dietary laws. To this day, Jewish people, they're allowed to eat cows, but they're not allowed to eat shellfish. Every day of their life, if they adhere to that law, then it still doesn't mean they're saved, though. It means they're being obedient, but obedience and salvation are two completely different things. And so the laws were put in place to encourage God's people to be obedient as a result of a change in their heart. The hope is everyone in this nation, Israel, would believe and know who God is. And so those laws are supposed to be uh, to come from a heart willing. We know that doesn't always happen though. There were people who weren't following God, but still they just knew this is something that I should do. And so in a perfect world, again, that's what would have happened, but sadly uh, not the case. It's sort of like you would expect the majority of people who go to church on every given Sunday to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to have saving faith. We know it's probably not happening though. You know, if we bring, you know, a three-year-old child, we don't expect them to have saving faith. Sometimes, you know, maybe a wife uh, drags her husband along to church. He doesn't have saving faith necessarily, but he just, you know, honestly doesn't want to make her upset and he just wants to make her happy so he goes to church um, teenagers maybe they don't have saving faith yet it's quite possible but that you know they come along because mom and dad say uh, as for me and my house we will serve the lord you're coming to church and hopefully you're going to learn and you're going to be convicted so there's a lot of different reasons why people in the church might not be saved but just coming to church doesn't save you that's the point that's sort of the correlation between what we do now and following those old testament jewish laws and that's the background of the events leading to what paul writes in galatians 2. the church in antioch one day had what we would consider the best the best relation to what we might do nowadays and have a church potluck meal they got together they were eating and it was a great thing they had Jewish people and non-Jewish people united in faith in Jesus coming together. Well, what you have is you have people who were raised eating one thing and people raised eating another thing coming together. You have burgers and you have pork. You know, you have, you know, ham and you have other things. And so there were people who said, I'm not allowed to eat pork. I'm not allowed to eat ham. And others say, hey, we've eaten it my whole life. We're the Gentiles. That's what we do. So that's what happened where Peter was sitting down at the table eating with the Gentiles. Now, we don't know what he was eating. We don't know if he was just, you know, uh, eating a pulled pork sandwich. Like, you know, he said, wow, I'm glad that this whole crucifixion resurrection thing came and went because now I can eat all this good food. And now I can have a hot ham and cheese sandwich and all this. I don't know. But the fact is, he was associating with the Gentiles at the same table. All of a sudden, some Jewish men show up in the middle of the meal. He gets up. Maybe he puts down what he was eating. Maybe he discreetly tosses it in the uh, garbage can. And he walks over, and now he's associating with the Jewish people. No, they don't. They, I don't want them to see that I was with these other kind of people over there. What does that do to the unity of the church? And the Apostle Paul is in at this same church of the same thing. First of all, can you imagine going to church? Here's the Apostle Paul. Here's the Apostle Peter. Here's Barnabas. 
they're all in one place at the same time. They knew each other. They were friends. They were doing all this sort of stuff together. And so he's basically, based on uh, what Peter's doing, he, uh, he says we should follow, basically we should follow Jewish customs around the Jews so they don't think badly of us. But when they aren't here, well, yeah, I'm, I'm free to, you know, do whatever I want again. That's the idea that Peter was uh, expressing through his actions, and that's not good. And Paul saw it. He said, Peter, you're a hypocrite. You're acting one way in front of one group and another way in front of another group. Not good for the unity of the church. And so that Paul gets upset about this. And he must have thought very highly of Barnabas, by the way, in the way that he writes this. He says, even Barnabas was led astray. Now, Paul doesn't go over to Peter and say, Psst, Peter, hey, uh, come on over here. I got something I want to tell you in private. I don't think what you're doing is good and so forth. No, um, Paul lays into Peter in front of everyone. And we have to stand back, take a step back and think, was Paul right by doing that? I think he was. Because he explains his justification in verse 14. He says, I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. And when a person is engaging in conduct not in step with the truth of the gospel, others in the church have an obligation to address it. Not, it doesn't necessarily have to be in such a public manner like Paul did here. This is a specific instance, and I'll explain that shortly. But sometimes we might admit later, maybe there's, we need someone to set us straight every now and then. And so in his, Paul's case, the issue was so significant and so crucial to the advancement of the gospel that he said, I have to stop this right now. And so he confronts Peter directly and publicly. And part of the reason is because it's not only Peter who was in the wrong. Barnabas was in the wrong by following Peter, and there were others. We don't know how many there were. There were several anyway. So to just pull Peter aside doesn't allow the others to see that Peter was wrong. So that's part of the reason, again, that Paul called him out in front of the whole group. They had to see that Peter did wrong and that they were wrong by following someone who was wrong. Just because you see a leader do something that's wrong doesn't justify you doing it. Nazi Germany taught us that, didn't it? People running concentration camps, they give the soldiers the uh, directions, do this, do that. Each and every person that was involved in that could not say, well, not my fault, I was just doing what I was told. No. God, that doesn't fly with God, whether it's in, you know, concentration camp or in the church or anywhere in between. In Galatians 2, the good news, though, is that Peter accepted the correction humbly. We don't read, Paul doesn't tell us an exact word that Peter said. Because he said, because he already stood condemned. We think he probably, once Paul stood up and started talking, Peter probably thought, oh boy. He saw. I was wrong. It's probably what happened. It's easy to stand in judgment for us against what Peter did, but again, who among <laughs> us hasn't ever done one thing in the presence of one group and one thing in front of another? For me, honestly, that was the story of my high school years. That's what it, it was, you know, back then. Thankfully, I have moved on from that and I've matured, you know, because in high school you're just so concerned about, I want these people to like me, and so I'm gonna maybe say I like a type of music I don't really like, and over here I'm gonna do this, you know, just to get some more friends and that they won't, you know, bully me and make fun of me and all those kind of things. But Peter, accepted correction and admitted that he made a mistake. That is the mark of a humble follower of Jesus. If we only look at the worst points of Peter's life, we would have a list that makes us think this is a pretty bad guy because we know that, for, for instance, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter wouldn't keep his mouth shut. 
He's up there with Jesus and Elijah and Moses. And he's so elated, let's make three temple or three, three tents up there. The problem with that is he's putting Jesus on the same level as Elijah and Moses. And so God speaks down at that time, if you remember that story. So Peter didn't really think before he thought he, he spoke there. Or maybe you remember the time when Jesus or Peter boldly declares, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Great. We're glad he did that. And shortly after, Jesus says, by the way, I'm going to have to suffer and be killed. And Peter pulls him aside. Oh, Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about here. That's not going to happen to you. And so what does uh, what does uh, Jesus, how does Jesus respond? Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. A second instance where Peter drastically fails. And we all know the denials of Jesus. Two, three of them, by the way, not just one, you know, um, little instance there. But Jesus restored him afterwards, and you probably know that story. And that's even before we get to Galatians 2. So at least four instances I've just shared with you, and those were ones that I was preparing. This just came off the top of my mind. I didn't really spend a lot of time researching a lot of those things. There could have been more. And so he's in this situation where he is eating with these unclean Gentiles, and he is not pointing them towards the gospel truth through his actions. He's doing the opposite. But... As I said, what I do see in Peter is a man who is growing and slowly maturing. And I think that the Christian journey is oftentimes one of two steps forward and one step back. And then two steps forward and one step back, if you know what I mean. Hopefully we make progress forward, but we know that we're going to fall back from time to time. But um, we are human. Being human doesn't ever excuse bad behavior, but we have to understand that we need to have reasonable expectations about ourselves and others at the same time. And as I've said, I can tell that Peter was maturing because of the way he accepts this correction. So many times nowadays, it's easy for us to avoid being corrected. I don't want to admit that I'm wrong because it makes me feel not so good about myself. You know, I didn't do that. I wasn't wrong by doing that and so forth. And so it's so easy nowadays. It's so, obviously, it's so different now than it was back in the days of Peter and Paul. But nowadays, you know, in church, if someone calls me out for doing something that I know that I did, maybe I, you know, um, stole something or that's an extreme example. But whatever the case is, I don't have to put up with this. I just won't go to that church anymore. I'll go to church on the other side of town. So it was a little different back then. But we do have the opportunity to learn from our mistakes and grow from our mistakes too. The Bible shows even more instances where certain individuals made mistakes, but they uh, proved to be useful after all. One of my favorites is in the book of Acts, Luke, who wrote Acts, writes this. Now Barnabas, he comes up again, Paul knew Barnabas a lot. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought it best not to take him with them, not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had gone with them to work. And now there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed to away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers of, uh, to the grace of the Lord. And he went to Syria, strengthening the churches. So there's a disagreement. Apparently Mark, he's a young man, John Mark, they call him. Um, he was going along on a missionary journey. Something happened and he, he, um, he failed. He, he said, I, I'm, I'm done with this. This is too much for me. He left them in the dust pretty much. Paul said, I can't take him along on the next journey because he, he didn't follow through for us before. 
Now, Barnabas is different. He, his name means son of encouragement. He's always an encouraging guy. And so Barnabas says, you know, I think John Mark needs a second chance. Well, Paul says, hey, if you want him, you take him. I'm going over here. What I love about the story is that it comes back together where later on, Paul says in one of his letters to Timothy, bring John Mark because he is useful to me. Many years passed. In those years, we think that John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. So had that disagreement and all not happened, if Mark hadn't gone with Barnabas, we wouldn't have our second gospel, or at least the way that it happened anyway. And so that's a verse that I love because it shows us that hard feelings don't have to persist and people can grow and mature and change. And Paul now deems him useful. Now I wanna bring him along. He's grown, he's mature, he's helpful. And the Holy Spirit used this humble yet willing individual to accomplish something that he, I'm sure he never expected. You know, writing the whole gospel. I know it's the shortest of the gospel, but it's a gospel anyway. So as I try to bring this together, I've, I've mentioned Peter's share of mistakes, and we know the one in Galatians 2. This is the only time in the Bible we read of this, so it's not told for us anywhere else. And Peter, though, we know what he went, went on to do. He did great things for the Lord. He wrote two epistles that are in our Bible, too. And so, guess what? The epistles, which were later, he wrote these words. So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. He doesn't shy away from using the word hypocrisy. We can't say, wow, Peter's really a hypocrite because he is a hypocrite telling us to not be a hypocrite. No, it's not like that. He matured, he grew, he went past that and he learned from his mistakes and now he doesn't want other people to repeat those same mistakes. That's not being a hypocrite at all. That's being a mature follower of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to give direction. He says, like newborn infants, long for the spiritual milk, pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Those followers of Jesus, we can learn from the events like this, learn from those who came before us. And I wanna leave you with the encouragement, knowing what, that knowing what I know about Peter, that he grew into be this very strong, yet humble and wise man, I really think if he were here today, he would say, I'm glad that everything happened as it did because if not for being called out by Paul, who knows what I might have done uh, to uh, tarnish the gospel even later on in my life. Sometimes we can't see those things when we're going through the, the uh, events, but we can uh, later on look back and as they say, hindsight is 2020. And I'm sure that Peter wouldn't change a thing if he could uh, be here with us today and talk about those things that happened. I hope that we can all say that at least some of our mistakes have served such a righteous purpose as Peter's did and how God used them to make us mature and stronger in order to serve him better. Let's bow our heads and go to the Lord now in prayer. God, we thank you for your holy word. When you piece together the different letters and we make sort of a chronology of it, we can fill in the uh, blanks very easily. And we can see how your hand was on this whole situation. You were on, you, you were there with the disagreements and it's hard to be a Paul who had to stand up in front of everyone and, and uh, rebuke the apostle Peter the one that your son Jesus said is the rock upon which the church will stand. Paul knew what he did was wrong and he was not afraid to call him out on it. And God, we see what else happened with John Mark and we see what Peter went on to do and the encouragement that we get from all of that. So God, we're just thankful for your holy word and the truth we find in it. We ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us this week as we go out into the world proclaiming Jesus Christ either by mouth and or by our actions too. 
that we thank you and praise you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.